presenter is Alan Ligault from Hardent. Uh, Alan is uh, uh, v Vice Pre VP IP products at Hardent, where he is responsible for spearheading the product definition and development of its semiconductor IP portfolio. He has more than 25 years of experience managing multidisciplinary engineering projects and developing video related semiconductor products. He holds a BSEE from Polytechnic Montreal. Great. Welcome, Alan. Please take us home. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you to be here today. Over the next uh, 40 minutes, uh, my objective is to um, introduce you to what is DSC, uh, make you familiar with uh, the display stream compression algorithm, uh, tell you a little bit about some of the application and emerging application for DSC in consumer electronic, and finally start to give you some, uh, some overview of how you can integrate DSC in your next semiconductor project for uh, consumer electronic application. As you're gonna see, although DSC was originally used in primarily in mobile ap application, it is starting now to be used in several other applications. So let's start with what is DSC? And you know, maybe as a first question, is why, and, uh, why is DSC needed? What, uh, what kind of problem does it try to address? So it's quite typical in many use case to have a, a processor with some video input that needs to transmit over a display module the computer graphic and video information. And nowadays, uh, more than often, this is done over some serial link. I mean, uh, we can look, for example, the mobile application processor would utilize MIPDSI to send uh, computer graphic information to a DDIC device on the display module for mobile. Could be a GPU card sending to a computer monitor information using display port, which is another serial uh, transport. Or it could be uh, in a car, an application processor sending uh, display information to the car infotainment system uh, using some proprietary uh, transport technology. So this is quite typical. Now what happened is that uh, over the last uh, several years, the increase in display resolution uh, utilized in application have been going up very rapidly, over a factor of 2x per year. You know, we, we used to be using Full HD, QHD, now we're up to UHD, which is 4K resolution, and moving now very quickly to 5K, and even we're talking about 8K, uh, which w I think will be seen at next CES in 2017 in January. While uh, the display has been going up very rapidly, unfortunately, the serial uh, transport technology uh, has been, been able to keep up in terms of the speed increase, and it's been, it's been more like 20% per year in terms of increase in speed. So a gap was created, and there's not too many ways to address this, this gap. There's really only two ways. You can either increase the number of lanes and have multiple serial link in parallel to transmit the additional uh, information, that the transfer rate which is needed, or you could use some ways to compress the information, reduce the transfer rate, and this is uh, the approach that uh, we've been looking at. So, the, you know, when you're looking at the compression technology, it's all about trading off things. So, if you have, say, uh, you know, eight megapixel, and you have 24 megabyte of data to transfer, you can uh, compress it more or less and have a certain amount of bit per pixel. Of course, if you push the compression factor to a higher compression uh, um, factor, the problem is that the complexity of the compression technology increase. Uh, you, have, you require more gates, you require more powers, you require more buffering, more frame buffer. Cost of the solution gets higher and latency is also getting higher. 
So in our research uh, in the VESA task group committee, which I will talk about, we found that there was a sweet spot where if uh, you, know, you would aim at the two to three X compression, you would be able to design a technology that would not be so expensive in terms of buffering and number of gates. It would we'd call this a lightweight compression method. While you would enjoy a factor of two to three X and, and, and gain some benefit. And that, that was sort of the starting point uh, of our uh, research in the task group. So when you consider this two to three X compression now, and over two years, so from T0 to two years later, the phi speed have increased by 1.2 uh, every year. So you have a 1.44 X factor increase in speed. If you use some bit coding, you benefit another 1.2 X. And you have your image coding now that uh, gives you this other two to three X. So you end up with a link speed effective increase of three and a half to five times over two years. And this is really uh, the way we manage to bridge the gap and allow to bring higher resolution display technology using uh, commonly used uh, speed uh, link transport technique. So to put that in perspective with some, um, some you know, uh, display resolution used uh, nowadays, I have this uh, chart here that shows different display resolution. And I uh, will pay attention to the 4K resolution because it's quite popular these days. And we're talking about an effective bandwidth of 16 gigabit per second required if you don't use compression. So if you map out 16 gigabit of, uh, of transfer uh, requirement onto a D5 version 1.1, which is 1.5 gigabit per lane, and you, if you set yourself to use a maximum of eight lanes, you wouldn't be able to do a product with uh, 4K using uh, D5 1.1. With D5 1.2, which operate at 2.5 gigabit per second, you would require eight lane without compression. If you add the VSC compression, 3x factor, you would require four lanes with the D5 1.1 and only three lane with the D5 1.2. So you see right away the benefit for a system designer to use compression technology. Of course, uh, you know, you don't want to use compression technology and start trading off uh, picture quality. So as we're going to see in my presentation, a lot of emphasis in our work was put in to ensure that we would have a visually lossless experience and that uh, at the end of the day, you wouldn't trade off picture quality. So now the system look more like this. So you have your processor with the GPU and video picture input. You incorporate in the processor a DSC encoder that takes the picture before transmission, compress it down by 3x. You transmit it over your serial link. And then at the receiver stage, you buffer it in the frame buffer while it's still compressed. And finally, when you're ready to display, you recreate the raster image and pass it through a DS DSC decoder to uh, recreate the raster image. So that's the principle. So in late 2012, early 2013, VISA, the Video Electronics Standard Association, created a new task group called the DSC task group with the objective to create this technology and uh, make it available on the, on the market. So our company hardened along with uh, you know, Broadcom, Intel, Samsung, and other large players have got together and started working on this. So over an effort which lasts uh, roughly about two years, you know, we did the following, we accomplished the following uh, tasks. So first we made a call for proposal to the industry. Six company came back and offered uh, proposed technology. And uh, we created a selection committee that uh, benchmarked the different uh, proposals. Essentially, what we received were C model, 
of the proposed algorithm. We use a set of picture uh, test images. We conducted a lot of benchmarking and picture quality tests. And we decided on the Broadcom uh, BDC algorithm as our starting point. And uh, that was the starting uh, of the work. After that, we um, work for several months in improving uh, the picture quality by adding additional algorithm to the Broadcom BDC uh, uh, technology to really bring to the market, uh, you know, uh, an algorithm that would be very, very effective for natural images, text and graphic that would be very, very performant. Of course, uh, the objective was to do that uh, along with some transport technology. So the initial work was done uh, very, working very closely with the MIPI Alliance, and there was a liaison committee that was created, and the objective was to bring the ASIC technology on the DSI link with the objective to bring this technology to the mobile market, and that's what we did. Give you a sense of how much work was involved, it took 31 version of the C model before we finally released it. So uh, in April 2014, the, the, the announcement was made and uh, the first uh, specification was released in the summer 2014. And uh, now more recently in January 2016, uh, a few months ago, we released a version 1.2 and I will explain the difference. Now we're two years later, the Visa task group still exists and still working on to some future version of DSC, but uh, of course it grew into a much larger task group because uh, it captured a lot of interest and attention, and uh, we have objective uh, to release additional versions that are more capable in the future. So to talk a little bit about the algorithm itself, it's a fairly complex algorithm that uh, what are you going to find sort of typical stuff you find in compression technology like predictor, quantization, and entropy coding. So, I mean, to, to, in a nutshell, the DSC codec is a constant bitrate encoder, which means that uh, you give a target amount of bits per second you want to come out of the encoder, and the encoder will make always a an effort to always fit within the bandwidth available. In order to do that, it uses a, a, a set of encoding tool based on a time domain uh, algorithm, which is a DPCM, a Delta Pulse Coded uh, Modulation, and a set of prediction tool, midpoint, block predictor, uh, MMAP, and an ICH uh, algorithm that are uh, available to the encoder to make the most effective job, job to encode any type of content. I mean, a lot of other algorithms exist, whether they're DCT-based DCT base or wavelet-based, but what's unique about DSC is its ability to generate an extremely good picture quality, either with natural images, text, and graphic. And, uh, you know, we don't suffer from any kind of um, um, jaggy edges or, or um, you know, obscure edges where you'd see with a DCT or a wavelet-based algorithm in the case of DSC. Uh, DSC, as I mentioned earlier, is targeting visually lossless experience with compression effectiveness of two to three X. And uh, in order to be really lightweight and be uh, fairly inexpensive to implement, uh, it only utilizes a single line buffer, which is a very small amount of static RAM inside the algorithm. You don't require any external frame buffer, which is SD, RAM base, or anything of that nature, which means that it's uh, inexpensive and creates super small latency of the order of microsecond. Essentially, the DSC encoder delays the output by one horizontal video line and the decoder do the same, so you have two H-line delay, which is essentially microsecond. In order to claim to be visually lossless, we made a lot of tests, and I think DSC is probably, uh, you know, the effort we've done at TASGO is probably one of the most significant test picture effort that was done in the industry. 
And we used the, the, the methodology I was described. Essentially, we took a group of uh, 30 independent uh, observers, people in uh, roughly about 30 years old, uh, so they still see well. And uh, we, we, we put them in front of uh, super high quality monitors at a, a fixed distance, and they were shown two pictures at a time a reference picture and a, another, the same picture next to it was alternating between the reference picture and the compressed picture at about five hertz. And doing this method, if one of the two pictures have defects that are visible because of the alternation between the reference and the compressed picture, the difference would really jump at you. And um, that's essentially what we've done. And of course, it was randomized. You will know whether it's on the left or on the right. And for every uh, two pictures they were shown, they were asked to see which one is uncompressed. If you cannot tell the difference between the two, it's like flipping a coin. You're going to end up basically having uh, you know 50%, which is uh, essentially they look the same to you, which is, it's visually lossless. If the difference is really perceptible, everybody is gonna get it, so you're gonna get some obvious difference, and more or less 100% of people are gonna guess it right. And if you're right in the middle, this is where you start to see what we call a just noticeable difference. And essentially, we figured that if you draw a line on the left of this, this is your visually lossless area. I'm not going to go in more detail here, but uh, Dave Stolitska and David Hoffman from uh, Samsung uh, are behind uh, essentially this methodology. They wrote an excellent paper, which I will give a reference at the end of my uh, presentation. But uh, this methodology has uh, attracted enough attention that now it's been used as an evaluation procedure as an ISO standard. A lot of people in the past have used other approach like PSNR, Picture Signal Noise Ratio Methodology, which is known to be objective. The problem with that is when you start automating uh, the measurement, you could find pictures that have extremely good uh, PSNR, like 60, but all the defects are located in one area of the picture, and effectively most people are going to find the noticeable difference. So we figured that our methodology, although it is more expensive because they're required to be uh, using a lot of observer, is more effective. And we've done that. And so when we're saying that 3x is truly visually lossless, we have all the results to prove it. So why would someone want to adopt DSC? Well, there is obviously what we already talked about, which is the decrease in transmission bandwidth that allows you to use um, higher resolution uh, with uh, standard transport, but there are also other advantages. You can actually reduce the cost of your system, you can reduce the footprint, you can lower the EMI generated by your product, and one very important thing, you can save power. And saving power in mobile, as we all know, is a key aspect. And why would you be able to do that? So I will illustrate it using the mobile application. So in a mobile, you have an application processor that communicates the computer and graphic information over MIPDSI with a certain number of transmission lane to a display driver IC, which resides in the, in the display module. And the display module typically has a frame buffer to store that, pic that picture. So if I add a DSC encoder in my application processor and I add a DSC decoder in my display, I can actually remove some of those DSI lanes. I've shown it earlier. We could go from eight lanes down to four lanes. So effectively, when I do that, I remove some logic and I remove transmission lanes, which require lots of power. Given that the image that arrives in the display driver IC is actually smaller because they're compressed, I can reduce my frame buffer in terms of amount of memory required by three times. So effectively, 
I save power, although I consume more power with my encoder and decoder, I actually the, the, the sum of all is I save power. And um, I have actually a smaller footprint solution and it's lower cost. And this is really the reason why uh, the, right from the start there's been a lot of traction and the strong adoption of DSC by the mobile uh, key players. Nowadays, MePDSI 1, uh, 1.2 and above uh, have definitely set on the use of DSC, but more recently, uh, embedded DisplayPort 1.4 and DisplayPort have also adopted as a standard the use of compressed uh, DSC uh, transfer uh, on their transport. And I can tell you there are more transport technology in the coming that will adopt DSC. So now we have two versions of DSC, uh, version 1.1 and 1.2, that are uh, both very capable. The main difference is in the type of color space and uh, chroma sampling that are supported. With DSC 1.1, we supported RGB 444 in 8 and 10 bit per component, so 24 and 30 bit pixel. With DSC 1.2, we added native compression technology in YCBCR in 422-420 at higher color depth up to 12, 14, and 16 bit per color component. And why did we do this? We did that to enlarge the number of applications that could leverage DSC, primarily the digital television application. You know, all, uh, uh, although the computer guys and the mobile guys have set their use of RGB, television utilized YCBCR as a color space, and uh, especially with HDR, the high dynamic range application, it's interesting to have a bit long, more color depth. The industry have started launching products that are based on DSC. At the chipset level, you get product like Qualcomm Snapdragon 820, which is a, a significant, significant chip in the industry. Uh, NVIDIA Tegra X1 also support DSC. Of course, an application processor like this support DSC. You can expect that many, many uh, display module solution now support DSC at the decoding stage. In the second part of my presentation, I would like to highlight and show you different consumer electronic applications that leverage DSC. I mean, starting with the mobile industry, we kind of already talked about that one. It's sort of the obvious case. You have the application processor, which is a center of your mobile device. You have DSC encoder that were added, like in the Snapdragon or Tigra from NVIDIA. And then you have the decoder and the display module, and that uh, basically give, offers you the advantages that I described already. But now there is DSC coming inside cars, and why would car wants to use DSC? For a different sets of reasons. In, uh, in the higher end car now, you have lots of cameras. You got the backup camera, the front, ca the backup camera to back up your car. You got front camera looking at the lanes to make sure you're not, uh, you know, overlapping lanes. Some uh, sophisticated car now are replacing side mirrors by cameras to, uh, to overview, and you could have actually additional cameras. So five, six camera is very common now. You also have an uh, infotainment system, so you have like television in the back of the car for the kids to watch movie while driving home so they don't drive you nuts. And uh, you have uh, also the info to, uh, some display at the front of the car for the car information for the driver. All of this information need to be communicated inside the car using cables. Cables are the third most expensive components inside, car, inside cars, so car makers are extremely sensitive to the cost of cables. In order to uh, limit the number of cables and, uh, and offer more bandwidth, although they don't use 4K uh, video inside cars, if you apply DSC at 3X, you can actually have three times more stuff coming around the same level of cables. And this is really the idea behind the use of DSC. So 
what people are looking to do now is to add the DSC encoder inside every uh, source of video and add a DSC decoder onto every display and then they can actually uh, benefit of the advantage that I mentioned. So, of course, also application processor are arriving inside cars. So, you know, there's a natural migration from mobile to uh, the car industry to do that. Another case is the AR, VR, and mounted display. Uh, very different than cars, but a lot of advantages to use DSC. Um, in the VR market, people are having essentially a display very close to their eyes, so they need extremely high resolution because they, they, they got the pixels so close to their eyes, and they also need a, an increased frame rate, like we're talking not, no, not anymore about 60 hertz, we're talking about 90 or even 120 hertz, in order to get really this very smooth motion so they don't get seasick, essentially, you, uh, wearing their device. While they do this, they need a very, very low latency uh, in order to have a really good experience. The challenge is that some of these devices are battery operated. They need to be small because they're in your face. They need to be light. They need to uh, have battery that lasts more than 10 minutes, so power consumption is key. And of course, we'd like the product to be inexpensive. So by using DSC, a set of encoder and decoder at the capture video stage, at the video processing, at the micro display level, you can actually uh, enable the system to always use a compressed video frame. As you capture video, you encode them and you bring them over the local frame buffer in the capture domain. If you want to do any processing on it to uh, make an analytical decision or, or make transformation, you read them over, you decode them, you process them, and you bring them back in system memory through another encoder. And finally, at the display stage, you need to decode them at the, in the display module. So using a combined set of DSC encoder and decoder, you can lower substantially the, the memory bandwidth requirement of your design. You can save considerably the amount of uh, RAM you need, and uh, you will lower the power consumption of your system. So there are many, many advantages while ensuring a very low latency experience. So we're seeing people starting to adopt DSC for this kind of application. Another type of application that uh, we've seen a lot of adoption is in the upcoming emerging USB type C uh, application. USB type C have, uh, have been launched uh, and it's very, very attractive and interconnect because everything comes out of one uh, connector, which is reversible, uh, so it's very easy for end user to connect. Uh, it is very shallow, so it allows to design very slim computers, and it incorporates everything you want. You have power delivery, so you can charge your laptop or charge the device attached to your computer with USB Type-C. It, of course, carries the USB data, which USB was invented for, but it also allows you to carry the computer, the video and audio information to your external display over the what's so called alternate video mode. And DisplayPort uh, 1.4 is one of the video modes which is supported by USB Type-C. So it's really, really cool. The problem that it creates is since everything comes out of the same wire, there's a lot of bandwidth required. So if you start attaching external video device, external display, like 4K display device to USB, USB Type-C, you're gonna consume so much bandwidth that at some point there's gonna be nothing left for your other device, like the, uh, you know, the network uh, attach or the storage. So there has to be a solution, and we believe that DSC is a very compelling solution. So this is my laptop, and these are my external monitors. 
So if I add the DSC encoder in my GPU card, then when I send video out to send to external monitor, instead to consume 16 gig for each of my 4K display, I consume something like five gig, five gigabit per second. And I, I just left a lot of bandwidth uh, left for other devices. Uh, the only other requirement is I need to have a DSC decoder into uh, my external monitors. So we're starting to see device coming out on the market that not only support USB Type-C, but support USB Type-C with embedded display port uh, that incorporate compressed uh, transport of video. I think uh, we will migrate to display that will natively support DSC, but uh, nowadays you're also going to find external device that are hubs and interconnect that will allow you to do these, uh, these kind of interconnect as we migrate to uh, native USB Type-C product. And uh, I think this is a, a, a type of application where you're going to see a lot of DSC adoption. Other people have looked to use DSC to transport over, say, a standard Ethernet, uh, a 4K video. So, you know, 4K video is 16 gigabit, compressed by 2x, it's 8 gig, fits well in uh, 10 gig Ethernet. So you can do application like this. And finally, uh, primarily because of DSC 1.2, which now supports, uh, you know, color space, which is friendly to the DTV application, I think you're going to start to see more DSC being used inside uh, set-top box and, and television. I mean, television, uh, I've seen some 8K television at uh, last year's uh, CES 2016. We were involved, actually, with uh, those, uh, those television maker uh, having DSC in their design, but, you know, it's incredible the bandwidth that you have inside an 8K television. You're talking about 64 gigabit of data. And the, those televisions are obviously very large, and you have to carry uh, between the main uh, card in the back of the TV and the panel, you have to carry a super uh, high-speed uh, transmission line, line at very, very high frequency, which is a huge uh, challenge for, uh, for television designer. So by adding DSC in the system between the main board and the TCON, the timing controller chip in the television, we can reduce the frequency by three times, and that's a, a huge advantage. So you're going to find DSC inside the television uh, TCON chip, but you can also add it in the multimedia SOC and have the same uh, kind of benefit that I described earlier. To wrap up my presentation, I would like to uh, quickly highlight you, uh, you know, what is it about to add DSC to your next generation design. So typically, um, you know, you would want to add, uh, you know, an, a DSC encoder or decoder, depending on the product you're trying to design. And they're going to look like this. This is a sort of typical IP, like the one uh, we are offering in the market at Harden. And uh, you're going to have a video bus on one side and a compressed bit stream at the output for the encoder. And vice versa for the decoder, you're going to have the compressed uh, bit stream coming in and the decoder output going out. The, 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 the reality with DSC is we want to support all kinds of display resolution from QHD to 8K using all kinds of process from, you know, super fast TSMC 14 nanometer process or maybe slower process. So the thing needs to be scalable. And this is one of the, the things that was properly uh, well thought of in the DSC uh, task group. So this concept of scalability comes to the concept of doing what's called a DSC image slicing. So essentially the idea is that uh, if I have a fast enough DSC core, I could compress the entire one image in one shot. But if I can do that, then I break it up into a left and a right side, and then I give the task to two parallel IP core to do the job. And if that's not enough, then I can break it up into four different tiles, 
So essentially, you, you have the source scalability. So the power of this approach is that with any type of technology, whether it's slower or faster speed, if I put enough of those IP core, I can compress an 8K image, no problem. So I'll use a very typical example of 4K video at 60 frame, and I have an ASIC, which we're very typically we can achieve fairly easily 350 megahertz. Well, in 4K video, you have actually 600 megapixel to crunch per uh, second to, uh, to be able to perform in real time. So if each slice, the, the left and the right, because I'm going to need two, is 350 megapixel, I need two of them to be able to do that. And that would be sort of a typical way to organize an encoder and a decoder. So this scalability uh, brings all kinds of different uh, possibility. And uh, it is quite typical in application uh, for mobile and other that we would use one of our IP along with a, a DSI uh, uh, controller. And depending on the display resolution you will want to achieve, you can have a mix of one or multiple core to, uh, to do that. So in this uh, example here at seven gigabit per second, uh, a single core connected to a single DSI is gonna perform well. If I'm trying to do a 4K type application which is 16 gigabit, I may use two core along with uh, two DSI controller that uh, have like a sort of split panel type approach. So there are different type of permutation. When you design a system, of course you want it to be compatible. So you want to make sure that at the end of the day it's going to be compatible. So the task group also come up with what's called the CTG or the conformance test guideline. Essentially what, what this thing is, it's a, it's a kit that you download from the Visa website and you, uh, at different stage in your system, you bring those reference test image that come along with some uh, CRC code. And if you add the, the right logic in your design, you can actually make a calculation of CRC code at different point in your design. And if the CRC code uh, match what is expected, you sort of guarantee that uh, you are truly DSC compatible. Because of course, DSC being a standard and with all the interconnect of uh, wanting to connect, you know, vendor A GPU with vendor B monitors and vendor C uh, other display, uh, the conformance to the inter and making interoperable compatible product is very, very important. DSC has been uh, very much designed for ASIC uh, type application, but it's possible to prototype uh, your DSC application using FPGA. So it's something actually we've done. So, so to answer, like people often ask me, you know, do I have to commit this to an ASIC? You know, you may target an ASIC, but you know, there are FPGA implementation that allows to uh, prototype and experience and you know, I'll take the VR uh, application as an example. People have a very specific thing they want to make sure about, about higher frame rate, about stereoscopic view. So you can prototype your application uh, before you commit to expensive semiconductor. Uh, you're going to get the download of proceedings. So I put actually some links to the DSC white paper, the DSC standard itself, and the Visa membership. In order to be able to have the rights to use DSC, DSC comes, it's royalty free. The only uh, requirement is you have to be a Visa member. So if you decide to choose to embed DSC technology in your product, you have to subscribe to the Visa membership and uh, you're set to go and uh, you can design DSC compatible product. So there's 15 seconds left and uh, I completed my presentation. Do you have, uh, is there any question from the audience?
Yeah, uh, on one. Hello. Microphone. Hello. 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 Yeah. So uh, on one of the slides you said uh, of having DSC compression built into CSI cameras. So uh, and then you also said that you have done some user study that it's visually uh, um, lossless. Uh, my question is. Uh, how does this compression affect, uh, ha does, or does it have any impact on computer vision algorithms where it's not humans looking at the image? Does it have any impact on what? I'm sorry. On computer vision? Algorithms? Computer vision? Yeah, yeah. Uh, some tests have been done by uh, some people, and the conclusion has been that there was no impact. Okay. Uh, when it comes to CSI, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, DSC uh, works uh, with RGB and YCBCR color space. Mm. So, you know, if you use a CMOS sensor, you require to go from RAW to RGB color space before you involve DSC in your yes. application. Okay. So that would be typically done by uh, image sen uh, an ISP uh, device. Okay. But from there, you can compress DSC. And uh, being visually lossless, DSC can work fine with uh, sort of more like, uh, you know, uh, image processing and machine vision application as well. Yes. Okay. okay. And another question. Since uh, DSC is uh, quite new, the adoption is not completely penetrated the market. So, so you could be stuck in a situation with a panel that supports DSC and a SOC which doesn't. So my question is, can you, can you do the DSC encoding in software in those cases? Or is there any benefit also if you can do it? In yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, DSC is a, a very complex uh, algorithm, and it does not uh, translate well into a software implementation. Uh, a C model exists, which is published and available to VESA member. And to give you an idea, right now on a normal PC, it would take seconds to compress a single image. So there is no so, such thing like real-time software codec. So you know, some other codec do a great job at having like sort of real-time hardware capture uh, combined with a software, real-time display so software solution. Uh, not so well for DSC. DSC has been really designed with a sort of no compromise approach in terms of quality. And uh, it comes at a certain price in terms of uh, uh, algorithmic intensity and uh, it's sort of diff challenging uh, way to bring it to software implementation. So nowadays, it's, it would perform better with some hardware assistance, whether it be a hard, an ASIC or an FPGA implementation. Okay. Thanks. Good. There's probably over a dozen companies right now that are working on no glasses 3D phones and tablets. And if you have no glasses video, you can't compress it with any lossness because you'll smash the 3D views together. Is there any kind of uh, 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 non-loss uh, compression for uh, video and mobile? Uh, the DSC technology is what's so called visually lossless, so there are some loss, but they're not visible to, uh, to the user. If it's uh, 3D with no glasses, it'll be extremely visible. It will completely collapse the 3D. We're uh, starting to do some uh, testing uh, in this area on the task group. Um, I invite you to come. Uh, we have a demonstration in the exhibits uh, about the DSC technology at the hardened boot. Uh, you're going to be able to see that, uh, you know, the, you see that you will not see any defect. So we think that... Uh, I already know because uh, if you take no glasses 3D, uh, 444, and you even convert it to uh, YCBCR, it will collapse the 3D. Okay. So it's, it, that's a, it's a very well-known thing. So it needs some sort of good, uh, completely lossless compression for that kind of video. Would be very useful. It's a new market coming. Okay, well, it's something we can take offline. But thank you. Yeah, good question. 
Anyone else? Oh. Alain, thank you so much. All right, well, thank you, everybody.